All right, welcome everyone. So today's lecture is going to be on whole genome comparative genomics, which basically involves many, many computational challenges. And we're going to focus on genome assembly to start with, because the assembly is in fact an integral part of whether you're going to believe anything you find at the level of whole genome evolution, or whether it will be an, a genome assembly artifact. Genome alignment, because again, once you have the assembly, you need to actually figure out what regions of the genome correspond to what other regions of the genome across the entire genome. And then, you know, once you have that, uh, studying the patterns and process of uh, evolution, including uh, genome duplication. So uh, this is the second lecture of the uh, foundations part of the comparative genomics uh, section. And then next week, we're going to be talking about phylogenetics and phylogenomics. So uh, on lecture 17, on Tuesday, we basically focused on uh, comparative genomics and evolutionary signatures. This was basically using evolution to understand genomes. Now we're turning that wheel around and we're using genomes to understand evolution. So as you know, there's been dozens of uh, species that have been uh, sequenced and, uh, you know, Initially, uh, 14 E species, 12 fly species, uh, 32 mammals. Uh, now we're looking at uh, hundreds of E species, hundreds of fly species, and hundreds of mammalian species uh, all being uh, sequenced. So this field of comparative genomics has continued to increase the huge sizes of these data sets, and we're now uh, able to ask much, much more interesting questions. So the computational challenges associated with that that we're going to focus on today are uh, number one, genome assembly. And we're going to look at two methods for genome assembly. So first, consensus layout overlap. And then second, string graphs. And we're going to look at different methods for whole genome alignment. So basically how to resolve region correspondence, both at the nucleotide level and at the gene level. And then using that to understand mechanisms of genome evolution. And then we're going to focus on a very specific type of evolutionary event uh, which is uh, whole genome duplication. So look at what is the signature of whole genome duplication and how does that uh, give rise to new functions. This is a cartoon from the early days of uh, the human genome, back when uh, millions of reads were assembled, but in fact, uh, you know, there was still a lot of work to do in piecing together the pieces. Uh, my son just turned six, so he's uh, now starting to do uh, puzzles with 300 pieces. And then uh, finding a corner piece is kind of easy. If you have three billion pieces, finding a corner piece is a little harder. Um, but basically the, the, the key idea here is that uh, you can't sequence a whole genome yet. You can't just simply take a strand of DNA and sequence it from one end all the way to the other. All you can do is in fact sequence uh, small pieces of DNA. And the reason for that is that a lot of the technologies for uh, sequencing DNA start breaking down as the pieces get longer. So the traditional Sanger sequencing relied on being able to detect the difference in length between a size of a, a segment of 29 nucleotides and a segment of 30 nucleotides. And if you look at how these segments are sort of flowing on a gel, you could basically look at the incorporation of additional nucleotides as you uh, sequence more and more uh, bases. And that allowed you to now <clears throat> basically, you know, create the incorporate, basically engineer the incorporation of one more base. And you could tell whether that base was an A, a C, or G, or a T, or some combination thereof. And then based on that incorporation, you knew that that fragment that you had was size, you know, ended with an A. And then by running these fragments on a gel, you could basically see whether the 29th base was an A, or a G or a T or a C, and then keep going to sequence the uh, entire fragment. That breaks down when you can't tell the difference between a fragment that's like 700 nucleotides and 701 nucleotides, just because the difference in weight is just so small that at some point these nucleotides stop uh, being distinguished in their order. Everybody clears to sort of why traditional Sanger sequencing was unable to, to read these bases apart? Uh, with next generation sequencing, what you're doing instead is <coughs> visualizing a field of uh, DNA molecules 
and then the incorporation of individual nucleotides on top of that field. That uh, can theoretically go to much larger uh, lengths, especially if you start cleaving off, you know, the bottom as you sort of start incorporating the top. The, bot the problem is that, you know, this has still not uh, given us longer reads. In fact, Sanger sequencing could go to, you know, 700 nucleotides. Now we're looking at 70 nucleotides, so much shorter reads. Of course, the reads are many, many orders of magnitude less expensive, so it is absolutely worth going that way. But what that has led to is, in fact, fewer, uh, I mean, smaller reads rather than longer reads. So one way to overcome this limitation is to basically sequence both ends of a longer fragment. So, you know, you're starting with the whole genome. We can't sequence very, very long segments. So what we're instead going to do is chop up the genome and then sequence these smaller fragments. Everybody with me so far? So what, the way that we're going to sequence these short, shorter fragments is we could make these fragments be very, very small. We could make these fragments be, I don't know, 400 bases. And then we could sequence them from the forward strand and the reverse strand. And then we would have two sequencing reads from the same fragment overlapping each other and then giving us the same nucleotides, you know, at least reverse complemented of each other, which is great because the errors are usually sequence specific. So that basically means that if I have a A associated error on the opposite side, it will be a T. So I won't have the same type of error. So being able to sort of see the same sequence twice from the forward and the reverse strand basically means that you can overcome some limitations. But instead, what you can do is uh, create fragments that are longer than your read length. And that basically means that what you're going to end up doing is sequencing the forward strand, you know, in the five prime to three prime direction, and the reverse strand, again, in the five prime to three prime direction on the opposite strand of both, um, you know, fragments, uh, of both ends of the same fragment. So that basically means that what you end up with is a data set where you know snippets of sequence and you know roughly the distance between them. Why? Because when you fragment your genome, you can actually size select to only keep fragments of a particular size distribution. Was 100% with me so far. Awesome. So this is where uh, genome assembly comes in. So basically that's the starting data set. What you have is an underlying genome that you're trying to reassemble. You've chopped it up into tiny little pieces of a puzzle, and then you're trying to figure out how are these pieces going together. And you have sort of the ends of those pieces. And uh, that basically involves being able to align reads on top of each other. And we saw a lot of the techniques for genome alignment, so for sequence alignment. You can use dynamic programming. But in this particular case, you don't so much care about an evolutionary process that relates these. You expect these to be almost identical. Why would they not be identical? What are some, you know, there's two reasons why they would not be identical. What is some, one of them? Raise your hand. I'm basically assembling, you know, uh, the genome of a person, and um, there's two, you know, why would I just not have identical things when I uh, overlap? Yeah. Heterozygosity, great. So a particular person has two copies of human DNA. One copy from mom, one copy from dad. So that basically means that if mom and dad differed at that position, that person is going to have a mismatch between their own DNA. So when, you're, you know, when you have a very long sequence, so say you know, 70 nucleotides, one of these nucleotides might actually be different, truly different because there's a genetic variation between the two copies that this person heard. What's another different, what's another reason for the differences? Yeah. Yeah, basically sequencing error. So when I sequence DNA, I don't always get a perfect answer. Sometimes I get mismatches just because of the way that the polymerase chain reaction works or the way that the sequencing uh, technologies work. Sometimes something will look like something and it will be something else. Sometimes you won't quite be sure and you'll make a call and you'll get the wrong answer out. So you can have discrepancies in these overlapping regions due to either polymorphism or uh, sequencing errors. 
Okay, everybody with me? So basically, we're going to be using algorithms for alignment that are very, very fast and that assume you know, a small number of mistakes rather than an evolutionary process uh, of, of differences. Okay. So once you have that, you basically uh, are gonna, you know, either chop up the genome in two different fragment length distributions. That basically means that you're gonna have short gaps and long gaps in these gapped paired end reads. And the advantage of that is that you can sort of do a fine grain alignment and then use the longer segments to jump over uh, regions that are difficult to assemble. And what are these regions? Uh, these can be repetitive regions where you basically have, you know, just ancient polymorphisms or recent repeat, or sorry, ancient repeat elements or recent repeat elements uh, that have hopped in. And these element is found now thousands of times in the genome. When you sequence it, you have no idea which of those thousands it is. And if your reads are so small that they can't span the length of the repeat, then, you know, you're effectively doomed. You can't just, you know, cross that. But if you have very, very long uh, fragments, then the paired ends from both ends of that fragment allow you to now jump over very, very long fragments and basically have a unique sequence here, a unique sequence there, and then figure out the similarity between them. Raise your hands if you're with me. Awesome. Great. So there are two strategies for assembling these types of data. The first is overlap layout consensus. So the idea here is first, you simply align all reads against all reads. You basically, you know, just look for stretches of perfect similarity. And that's where a semi-global alignment algorithm comes in. Remember how we looked at different variations of the Smith-Waterman algorithm, where you could penalize end gaps, uh, or you could just penalize gaps or not penalize gaps or, uh, you know, find local alignments, but not penalizing, you know, um, end gaps at all. Or you could basically say, well, I want every sequence to align all the way to its end. I don't care about, uh, you know, um, overhands. Okay. So you basically find overlapping reads using a very, very fast algorithm like last or you know bwt or some kind of hashing based algorithm and then once you have that you can merge uh you know pairs uh of reads into uh you know longer segments so you know these can become a longer segment if that is relatively unique and then you can start creating contiguous stretches of a sequence known as contigs or contiguous uh, stretches okay and then you can start linking together these contigs into super contigs or scaffolds based on the paired end distance information. So you know that your library of fragments was roughly, I don't know, 10 KB. Then if you have a paired, uh, you know, an end pair, then you know that they're roughly 10 KB apart. Okay. And then once you have that, you can infer a consensus sequence. Who's 100% with me on this? Awesome, great. So uh, again, reads are these, you know, 500 to 900 base pair uh, long uh, words that come straight out of the sequencer. Uh, a mate pair is a pair of reads with two ends of the same insert fragment. A contig is a contiguous sequence formed by several overlapping reads with no gaps. A super contig or scaffold is an ordered and oriented set of contigs, usually by mate pairs. And then the consensus sequence is the sequence derived from the multiple alignment of a read of all the reads. In the okay. So how do you find overlapping reads? You can basically sort all the gamers in the read and then find pairs of reads that share a gamer and then extend to the full alignment, throwing it away if it's not above some kind of speed. To merge reads into context, you basically find uh, places where, um, you know, there's, unambiguous uh, alignment, and then uh, you merge those, and then uh, other places of unambiguous alignment, you merge those. And then from an unambiguous sequence, you might be entering an ambiguous sequence. So what you need to do is figure out what are the boundaries of this ambiguous sequence, and then how do we resolve that? So if you have you know, unique sequence here, unique sequence there, but 
overlapping sequences here, what you can do is in fact recognize that this sequence must be resolved somehow. And we're gonna talk about techniques for resolving these kinds of sequences. So you basically you know, start merging all the way to places where you now have you know, clearly two sequences or more coexisting. So uh, you can do that by basically uh, creating an overlap graph where your nodes are every read and your edges are the overlaps of these reads. You can basically say, well, these, these reads overlap here and you can see the transitive overlaps there. And then suddenly I'm entering two different paths. There's a very long path here and a shorter path there. That basically means that you know, there's some kind of duplication of this uh, region that ends in, you know, uh, in these unique sequences here. And I have to resolve it into, uh, you know, basically having something here, a unique sequence there, some, you know, an alternative there. So after you've basically formed your context, you basically end up with an overlap graph that basically says, you know, here I have a unique sequence. I'm entering an over collapsed region. Here I have a unique sequence. I'm entering an over collapsed region. And here I have my over collapsed region, which basically is traversed twice. So that basically means that, you know, this sequence appears somehow uh, twice in my genome. And in this particular example, if you have a tandem repeat where this particular X was duplicated with some differences, then you basically have uh, a graph that tells you I have my unique reads A, a transition into this duplicated uh, region uh, in red. And then I can uh, you know, traverse that back into the orange region, back out into the red region, and then into the blue region. Who's 100% with me so far? Awesome. So uh, when you have repeats that are shorter than the ring length, that's great. When the repeats have more base pair uh, differences than the sequencing error, uh, that's fine. Because if your sequencing error is, I don't know, 90, uh, it's 3% or you know, your accuracy is 97%, and your repeats are, uh, you know, 70% identical, that's perfectly fine. Because when you find a discrepancy, you know it's not due to your sequencing uh, error rate. But if the, um, uh, if the repeats are 99.9% .9 identical and your error rate is 3%, then most of the time, if you find a discrepancy, it means that you have a sequencing error. You know, you simply have no idea, of it, no, no, no confident way of attributing these differences to true differences between, uh, you know, these duplicated regions. Um, and what you can do to make the genome appear less repetitive, you can increase the read length by basically sort of sequencing longer fragments, or you can increase the accuracy of your sequencing. And then, you know, uh, error correction can basically discard the single letter sequencing errors uh, by noticing that in the trace itself or in the image that you were taking of your uh, particular sequencing reaction, you, you know, you don't have the confidence to call a particular nucleotide accurate. That can decrease your error rate, it can decrease your effective uh, repeat content, and it can increase your content length. And then to derive your consensus sequence, you have to somehow deal with these errors, uh, whether they're sequencing errors or whether discrepancies are due to polymorphisms, you have to somehow generate a consensus and you can derive a multiple alignment from all the pairwise read alignments and then derive a consensus uh, by you know, some kind of voting of the different bases, possibly weighted by their individual quality scores. Alternatively, you can basically say, what is the best quality letter? And then simply choose that one, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. So algorithmically, you don't have to design different algorithms how to, to deal with those. You just need to sort of construct a graph that has the corresponding lengths. So, you know, I didn't, for, uh, the reason why I didn't say, hey, first you do a short range assembly and then you use long uh, graphs is because you could include both in your algorithm. In practice, traditionally, uh, the original assemblies were basically using first a long, first a short fragment, basically construct context and scaffolds, 
and then the very long ones to almost in a semi-manual kind of way resolve the ordering of those large uh, fragments. But today's uh, assemblers are in fact mature enough that you can just throw everything at it at the same time. Other questions? All right, so that was the first part, basically the, the, you know, the first strategy for genome assembly. The second strategy is to uh, construct string graphs. And we saw some of that in the lecture about uh, RNA, the novel assembly of fragments. Uh, of, of RNA sequences uh, of transcripts and I told you that we're gonna um, see it again here. So if you look at the early uh, assemblies of the human genome, they were all based on consensus layout overlap. So basically, you know, the FRAP assembler, which is still very heavily used as, you know, FRAP sequencing scores for uh, Sanger sequencing, was developed by uh, Green in, you know, a series of papers starting 2002. This was the earliest assembly, it was very widely used, and it had a very good model of read errors. And then, uh, you know, the overlap was basically an order n squared algorithm. It was basically doing a layout, wasn't using made pairs, and just building a consensus. The Celera assembler, based on the private um, company that tried to sequence the, sequence, you know, the human genome at the same time as the, um, as the public effort, uh, Gene Myers basically wrote that first assembler that was able to handle very large genomes. He applied it to fly and then human and the mouse. And then that was also an overlap layout consensus. And then the Arachne assembler, which was used by the public sequencing effort, was uh, written by Seraphim Batsognu. And that also led to, uh, you know, the assembly of the mouse and several fungi. And that was also an overlap layout consensus. A new generation emerged in, uh, you know, the late 2000s. Uh, the earliest paper on that was written by uh, Pavel Pesner about the Euler assembler. And what that basically was doing was indexing and constructing the Bruin graph and then picking paths and building a consensus. The Velvet assembler by uh, Ewan Burney was, uh, again, based on short reads, uh, applied to small genomes. And it made a series of simplifications and also some very nice error correction uh, steps. And then the old paths assembler uh, by saint Nere et al. Um, was uh, basically short reads uh, dealing with very large genomes and then using the jumping data and then modeling the answer. So uh, this next generation of algorithms was basically based on these uh, string graphs or the brain graphs. So let's look at what those uh, objects are. So if you have this particular uh, pattern of repetitive elements in your genome, then you know, this region is repeated twice, that region is repeated twice, that region is repeated twice, sorry, the, the, light, the lime green is repeated three times. And then this is the true answer. This is you know, what the genome truly looks like. But you don't have access to this. All you have access to is this. You basically know that there are three different unique sequences here, here, and there, that are all entering this lime green read, uh, I mean region. There are three different ways of exiting this lime green region. There are two ways of entering this uh, magenta region and two ways of exiting. And there are two ways of entering this region and two ways of exiting, okay? But you don't actually know uh, what, how this resolves. And if you look at, what are all of the Euler tours that you can use to sort of, you know, traverse this? You can basically say, well, there's a lot of ambiguity. There's three choices here, two choices here, two choices here, and so on and so forth. But if you look at all the possible tours that traverse all of these edges, there are actually, you know, um, only a small number of such tours. Basically, you can go uh, this way. And basically, once you go here, there's really only one way that you can resolve this particular sequence. So this is not even... Uh, you know, ambiguous anymore. Basically, you know, this part can be unfolded out. Uh, and then the two possible tours are, you know, one which is a correct answer based on what the genome truly shows. And then the other one, uh, you know, transposes the exit of this particular, uh, you know, repeat and changes that order by basically flipping that side to this side. So given a shotgun data set of reads, we should be able to build a graph that looks like this. And then, you know, in order to build a string graph, you basically start with um, uh, reads and then you 
uh, transform those into the A read is in front of the B read. Okay, so you basically have uh, every read be a node, and every relationship between the reads be an edge, a directed edge. So then, if you have um, a more complex uh, graph, you can basically build chains of hey, there's an overlap between the A read and the C read, and there's an overlap between the A read and the D read, A and E, A and F, so on and so forth. And then you can start building these longer chains. But then there's so much information in these chains that's simply superfluous. You don't need to know about every single read that takes you from one context to another context if there's no ambiguity. So you can start collapsing these into uh, you know, a single edge. Was it 100% with me so far? Awesome. So you can now start asking, well, yeah? How do I get one? Oh, this is just a different example. It's, yeah, they don't have to be exactly uh, the same. Yeah? Yes? So right now we're not talking about whether they're identical or not. We're just talking about the fact that when you find an overlap between these two reads, you can represent it as this B region will follow the A region. And then you build this between all overlaps that you find. So rather than trying to construct a consensus sequence and then run into problems when the repeats are beginning, all you're saying is here are all the relationships between over overlapping segments. So if, you know, read A overlaps with B and C and D, then you can put all of that in the same graph as I have read A, read B, read C, read D. You basically know that this one is to the left of that one. There's only, basically there's directionality, you know, just because of the way that you're aligning things. Basically, if you find that A has an overhang on the left and B has an overhang on the right, you can put a directional edge. Of course, the direction is completely arbitrary, but it has to be consistent between them. Yeah? Yeah? So this is simply your individual reads. Whether you read it from the left to the right or the right to the left, it, you know, it's the same. So basically you traverse this and then you go here and then you go through those twice. Then you go back here and then you go back here and then you traverse that and you go out that way. Does that answer your question? Do you want me to retrace it again? Or? Well, I, just, I don't understand how the zero would affect These guys? Because you have one, uh, one path here that goes from green to purple and another path here that goes from green to purple. So these are the regions of the genome. In the next slide, the nodes and the edges are reads and connectivities between reads. In this particular case, I'm just showing you the regions of the genome. I'm not showing you individual reads in this particular case. There are many, many reads that span this particular region. And there are many reasons to span that region. After you collapse them, what you end up with is this. So the, the point of this slide is to introduce the concept of you know, this traversal graph. Now, how we obtain that graph is what we're going to talk about next. But this is just to, they're nearly identical. You could, you could think of them as identical, but you, know, you could also think of them as nearly identical. Got it. Perfect. Thank you. So as I'm sequencing the genome, I'm basically finding that all these regions are, you know, aligning on top of each other unambiguously. And then I'm finding that, oh, here, 
this region, which was an ambiguous, now is clearly connected to another region, which is actually found three times. And that's what this is coming from. This is basically saying, yes, that's the true answer, but I don't have access to the true answer. All I have access to is what I get from my sequencing machine. Yeah, so uh, I tried to allude to that earlier in terms of here's all the individual reads. These guys are uniquely aligning to each other. And then every one of those reads spans both a unique region and the repetitive region. So in a way, you know, every one of those reads basically tells me, oh, there's a unique component here and there's a repetitive component here. And that repetitive component appears twice, sometimes connected to the green unique region, sometimes connected to the orange unique region. Does that answer your question? Any other questions? So now we're basically saying, great, how do we get to that theoretical model of constructing that uh, string graph? And you can get to that from many ways. You can basically get to that from starting from the individual readers nodes, and then the edges being the you know, observed overlaps between these reads so that you ultimately get to a structure that allows you to reason about how to resolve these overlaps. And then it may, make, it may take many, many reads to go there, but then you, what you can do is simply collapse them, okay? Everybody with me so far? Yes? Um, okay, so then how do we collapse them? What you basically want to do is reason about all of the paths that I can take to resolve the string graph to traverse all of the reads. And then what you can do is basically say, you know, let's reason about the flow of information going into a particular edge and going out in a particular node and then going out of that particular node. So what you can do is basically say, you know, what are all of the edges that I could use to enter a particular node and what are all the uh, edges that I can use to exit that node. And then what you can do is basically say, you know, uh, if I have, X amount of coverage, if you wish. Uh, you know, what's really cool here is that uh, probabilistically, you can reason about the number of reads that you would get if you were to randomly sample the genome. And you would expect that that number of reads be, you know, just some random process. And if you have this kind of overlap, what you would expect is that the sum of the number of reads here should be the same as the sum of the number of reads here. So if I have on average 20 reads overlapping each of these regions, I should have an average of 60 reads over, overlapping that region. So basically because I'm sampling my genome uniformly, I'm you know, at random, I expect that the average coverage of that region be roughly three times the coverage here and three times the coverage there. Is everybody with me on that? So the uh, changes in the coverage that you see tells you whether a particular region was over collapsed and you can use that to start reasoning about you know the actual flow going in and out of the of each edge you can basically say well you know the flow here must be some amount the flow there must be some amount which basically tells me that this particular region is probably you know not utilized or I can argue about the flow here and then sum them up, uh, you know, to, to basically make inferences about the other, uh, the other side, basically the exiting versus the entering of a particular node. So then if you have reads that span uh, multiple regions of the genome, which are artifactual, you can actually detect that by sort of recognizing that the flows somehow don't agree here that basically there's simply no flow that can flow from here to there. So that basically means that the read that I obtained here was probably a chimeric read. That was just a sequencing error where in my PCR reaction, I artifactually uh, joined this particular segment to that particular segment. And you can do that by basically uh, reasoning about these flows. So you can run error cor correction algorithms, start fixing uh, some of these errors by trimming uh, the, you know, the actual reads and basically saying here's where something should end. And then you can, you know, 
uh, achieve these uh, feasible flows by removing uh, the fewest number of reads and then adding back uh, edges that you know were now consistent with those. So then you can use that you know iteratively and then uh, start resolving more and more of those uh, loops until you basically get to uh, a minimal uh, graph beyond which you can no longer resolve any ambiguities. And that's where, you know, that's where people are in many of these projects. They basically say, listen, with the current technologies, this is as much, as, as much resolution that I can get in my uh, string graph. And at that point, you can basically carry out uh, visualization experiments. For example, you can build uh, hybrid, hybridization probes, basically, you know, look at whether these regions are near each other in the chromosome. Or you could basically carry out PCR reactions with, you know, these probes to basically see just how long are the corresponding fragments and distances. And then you can sort of resolve that, um, you know, further. So who's with me on sort of the two different strategies? On one hand, you have the consensus layout overlap strategy. On the other hand, you have the string graphs that you can build, you know, from the bottom up, where you can basically, you know, trace these uh, reads and then uh, figure out how they connect and then reason about the flows in and out and then, uh, you know, resolve uh, these flows. Yes? Oh, so far so good? Okay, yeah. So what, what you basically do is ask, um, you know, about the, I mean, you can, you can use both the coverage as well as the, you know, the number of different ways that you're entering a particular region. And then using that, you can say, well, I have to have as many ways of entering as I have ways of exiting. And if, if there's simply no path that allows me to traverse that particular edge, that must be a mistake in my assembly or in, in mistaking my sequence of reads. Uh, what, what, what? No, you have to piece that together yourself. Basically, most of the time, the regions are much, much longer than your read, right? Yeah? Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. So basically the, the graph itself is weighted and directed, and that's what allows you to reason about the flows, basically. Yeah. So a lot of that can be experimental. You can basically say, you know, let's perhaps resequence my genome with relatively low coverage, but very, very long reads, for example very, very long fragments. So basically, even though I'm sequencing, you know, small ends of that, you basically can now say, well, this particular region here, for example, can only join with that one at this particular point, and then you can resolve that further. So that's sort of where a lot of these sort of multiple library sizes techniques came from. Um, so a lot of that picture is changing nowadays because uh, a lot of the sequencing ends up being resequencing of you know other members of a particular clade so you can use comparative genomic techniques to basically flow information from one species to another species if you're sequencing many individuals of a particular species like you know a bunch of different human genomes then again this changes because you now have a reference human genome this is very helpful when you have a completely new species that you're going after and then when you go after that you may choose to resolve these overlaps or to, to resolve these ambiguities or to simply just leave them be and just simply say, well, instead of having 10 chromosomes, I'm going to have 120 scaffolds. And that's as far as I can go. And then how these are pieced together, you know, might not matter if what I'm studying is nucleotide level evolution. But if I'm studying rearrangements, then I can only argue about rearrangements at the resolution of these scaffolds. 
Okay. All right. So once you have your genome assembly, then the next step to studying whole genome evolution is to basically carry out whole genome alignment. So basically, this involves resolving the correspondence between different regions of the genome. And you can do that at the level of regions, and you can do that at the level of genes. And you, you know, once you have done that, you can basically start studying mechanisms of genome evolution. So how do you align uh, genomes? So basically, uh, we saw that if you align a pair of species, then you basically need an order n squared algorithm to basically traverse this graph from, say, the bottom left to the top right. And then, you know, we saw how you could do that by simply having, you know, the, this approach where you only looked at the neighborhood. And then this took order n squared for two uh, species. For n species, say for three species, this basically becomes the same, but you're now traversing a cube. You're now starting, you know, at the beginning of the three sequences. You're ending at the end of the three sequences. And sometimes you're inserting a gap in, you know, one sequence by moving along this way and another sequence by moving that way, another sequence by moving that way. Or when you have a match in all three, you're basically moving diagonally towards here. If you have a match in only the two, but a gap in the third, you're moving diagonally towards there and so on and so forth. So basically this uh, generalizes uh, trivially to multiple dimensions by basically traversing the same dynamic programming, uh, you know, instead of a matrix, you now have a cube. And, you know, for every position, you have to look at all of the adjacent positions in that cube. Uh, as the number of species increases, this becomes, you know, very, very uh, expensive because this is, you know, to the power of the number of species. So the typical approach that is used is to now start doing uh, pairwise alignment. And then you can basically build a consensus of each pair and then use that to align to the other pair. And what's really nice about all of these algorithms, the dynamic programming algorithms that, that we have uh, seen, is that you can, with the exact same algorithm, basically deal with ambiguous nucleotides. You can basically say this is either an A or a T, because it was an A in one species and a T in another species, and then you can include that in your similarity matrix by simply computing the similarity between an A or a T in one species and then an A in the other species and simply weighing that accordingly or taking the max or you know, using some kind of parsimony. And we're gonna talk about uh, phylogenetic methods on Tuesday for how to resolve these uh, ancestral sequences. So that's how you basically deal with the increasing number of species. But then again, not everything is a full global alignment from the beginning to the end of every sequence. So basically the idea with local alignment is that you, know, you can basically first find between any pair of sequences, all of the little stretches that match, and then what you want to do is chain these stretches to basically find a global alignment that you know, captures the, the most parsimonious uh, evolutionary relationship between the species, where basically these repetitive regions you know, are still there, but there is you know, a unique sequence in between those. So what you can do is basically um, construct these seeds of your global alignment using uh, local alignment, and then carry out the full dynamic programming matrix only in the boundaries between these regions. So that is a restricted dynamic programming, which basically takes much, much less time because you don't have to actually deal with the full space. So this is the idea of sort of using first local alignments in highly uh, similar seeds and then simply not doing any computation on that space. Everybody clear how you can basically chain these local alignments into global alignments and uh, you know, use the dynamic programming only in the subset? Any questions? Um, that means that uh, you could exit from any of these places and any of these places, but if you go too far out, you're just simply not going to consider a path that goes that way. Yeah, you can basically simply not run it on any of these sort of shaded out areas. <laughs> 
but but that allows for more than one entry point rather than just going you know, that. all right and then you know this progressive alignment is you basically align pr progressively uh up the tree so then uh the combination of um local and global alignment has been sometimes termed uh glocal alignment which is a portmanteau between global and local and then the, co the concept there is to uh you know instead of only allowing um you know unique paths going up diagonally you allow that well there's a duplication here and there's, there's an inversion there and sort of there's rearrangement and so on and so forth so basically the goal is to somehow bridge the gap between those and tolerate not just sequence edits not just inversions but 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 also inversions translocations duplications and any combination of the above Basically, what you're trying to do with a global alignment, local alignment, is to find the least cost transformation of one sequence into another sequence using all these additional uh, operations. And maybe the right answer is this: that basically, you know, you have a duplication there, you have an inversion here, translocation there, where basically this segment went after that segment, and so on and so forth. And then here's, you know, one such example between uh, human and mouse, where basically, if you look at all local alignments. You have these C of, uh, you know, matches uh, in the off-diagonal items, but you can kind of see this region uh, that is, you know, more or less uh, conserved between the different species. And then uh, what global alignment allows you to do is basically recognize that, aha, there was an inversion here and here and here and here, and then there was, you know, some big insertion there and another inversion here and so on and so forth. So that's basically working at the nucleotide level to carry out the full uh, set of alignments. But now there's a lot of events that can happen at the nucleotide level that uh, you know might be much less constrained than uh, in protein coding region. Uh, one other strategy might be to actually simply focus on the coding regions. So what you can do is basically a gene-based uh, global uh, genome alignment. So then the idea here is that what you would like to do is um, figure out the correspondence between genes in one species and genes in the other species, and then use that correspondence as a basis for, uh, you know, for, for aligning the species. So one such algorithm is the uh, best unambiguous subgroups algorithm that basically tries to resolve the correspondence of genes and regions using the complete bipartite graph of the connectivity between any pair of uh, genes in one species and genes in the other species. So it integrates basically protein similarity and gene order information, and it can resolve gene correspondence uh, you know, quite well. So then the idea here is that if you're aligning two species uh, you know, that are quite distantly related, you would like to find all the true orthologs, but in some cases, there's a duplication event where one gene corresponds to two genes in the other species. And you'd like to capture the fact that, you know, this is a true orthologous relationship where this is the orthologue of both of these guys. And even though they're paralogs to each other, they're both orthologs to this one uh, gene here. And similarly, loss or merging and so on and so forth. But then the idea there is what you'd like to start with is uh, the bidirectional similarity uh, between uh, all of the genes in one species and the genes in the other species. So for example, this might be your pairwise uh, similarity score. These guys might be 80% identical. These guys might be 60% identical and so on and so forth. So how do you resolve the correspondence here? You could say, well, this is a best bidirectional hit and that's great, but this is not a unique best bidirectional hit. There's another bidirectional hit that in, is in fact, uh, you know, suggesting that, uh, Gene A in species one was in fact duplicating species two. And then similarly, uh, once you have figured that out, what you can do is basically block out all of the other genes that show some similarity by saying, hey, I have my best and ambiguous subgroup here. And then I can resolve that and then look for remaining similarities and then account for every gene across the different species uh, in that particular way. So what we can basically do is construct a full bipartite graph, turn that into a directed graph, and then look for best matches in each direction, and then effectively figure out what are the maximum out edges above some threshold, 
And then once you have that, you can affect, separate the connected components of that. And that effectively uh, gives you uh, your best and ambiguous subgroup. And then what you can do is effectively change the threshold uh, as you figure out what are the best matches and then start lowering that threshold and then keep iterating with a different threshold each time to capture effectively every genome. So what that allows you to do is effectively start resolving that uh, similarity. And the additional piece of information that you can use is the synteny, the fact that genes tend to maintain the same order uh, across species. So applying this uh, algorithm to basically uh, four species of yeast, what you end up with is an initial graph that looks like this, where there's a lot of uh, similarity because of paralogous regions. Yes? This is the similarity. You could think of it as percent identity. Uh, you know, basically the higher the score, the, the more similar two sequences are. Uh, basically, when you have a best bidirectional subgroup here, where every best match of every gene is actually preserved within the same group, so the best match of two is A, the best match of one is A, and the best match of A is either one or two, you've now kept all of them together. And then same thing for B, the best match of both B and C is three, so you're going to connect those together. So you're going to keep basically um, you're going to keep things together, uh, even though they, you know, they may not be unique yet. You're not looking for best by directional. You just want to make sure that there's no uh, ambiguity. Yeah. Yeah. So you could actually get a merge there. So basically, if you know, for example, gene three was split into B and C, then the best match of B will be three, the best match of C will also be three, and then they will be in the same subgroup. Yeah, so you can actually use the length of the genes to then figure out if these are merges or duplications. Yeah, and you can also sort of figure out which portion of the sequence they align over. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. So the threshold is there. So basically, you have some kind of relative threshold that you're using uh, there. So, you know, what you could basically say is um, in the first iteration, you basically have these subgroups. And then you might be able to partition them further by saying, you know, I'm now going to treat B as a singleton as it's by itself because the score here is much larger. So initially you account for every gene based on each bidirectional, based on each best hit, but because you're doing this bidirectionally, in some cases you might end up with, you know, um, places where there's uh, two genes, for example, that are competing for the same gene. You could say, well, if I lower the threshold, then each of them can find a unique match. And then you can resolve things further that way. All right, so basically you start with this very, very dense graph. And then after you know, the first iteration, you've resolved a lot of it. After the second iteration, you've resolved a lot of that. And then as you start adding now synteny information, you basically end up with a nearly you know, a perfect uh, line. And then you know that you're comparing orthologous regions. Basically, when you apply that to four uh, species of yeast in this particular example, you find that most of the genome uh, ends up quite uniquely uh, matching, which is very reassuring. But in fact, you find places where these very, very ni nice matches sort of completely break down. And this is one such example at the end of one of the chromosomes. Um, basically, of, at the right arm of chromosome one, you basically see that there's, uh, you know, just a lot more duplications and rearrangements and insertions and so on and so forth. And uh, this was, in fact, found in every arm of uh, every chromosome. And that, in fact, revealed uh, regions of rapid evolution. So in yeast, 
uh, it turns out that the ends of the chromosomes, known as, known as telomeres, are in fact, or subtelomeric regions, are in fact very rich of uh, protein families that are expanding uh, and contracting and duplicating uh, very rapidly. And these families are in fact very heavily biased to be associated with adhesion protein or you know, uh, environmental adaptation and so on and so forth, which appears to be some kind of evolutionary mechanism for um, having these regions both rapidly evolve and having enough copies that you could adapt different uh, copies of that gene to different environments. So that was you know, one example of the subtelomeric regions where you have gene families being expanded. You know, there's other examples that come up with chromosomal exchanges. So basically you have, uh, you know, nice intended region here and then the continuation basically goes into different chromosomes. You have transposition events that basically show repetitive elements inserting in the middle of other genes. You have inversions that are clearly visible by basically having genes that are switching order. And what we found, in fact, is that for nearly every inversion event, it was flanked by tRNA genes that were transcribed in opposite orientation and were often coding for the same uh, anticodon. So basically that suggested that tRNAs are in fact serving as a uh, you know, tool for carrying out these kinds of evolutionary events. So basically tRNAs of course serve a primary purpose in translating uh, codons into amino acids, but they also appear to be acting as an evolutionary uh, mechanism for uh, channeling and mediating conversion events. Uh, there were seg segmental duplication events that were very clearly visible. And then one of the weirdest uh, examples was an intine, which is basically uh, kind of like an intron and a protein. It's basically a um, segment uh, of uh, DNA that eventually gets transcribed and translated. And when that protein is translated, it effectively folds in a way that catalyzes its own excision. And the resulting gene is in fact, the resulting protein is in fact matching that original protein. But that segment is a self-replicating segment. So basically when it, when it gets translated, it catalyzes its own excision and then it reinserts its own DNA into the genome. So basically, it's sort of, uh, it's an endonuclease that can uh, basically cut the DNA and insert its own uh, sequence there. It's kind of a cool evolutionary uh, difference, uh, mechanism. So we found basically, you know, unique genes to each genome. We found changes in gene dosage. We found protein family expansions, uh, but relatively few genes. And then, you know, for every translocation event, where basically you had one chromosome switching to another chromosome, you have Composable elements mediating that, and for every inversion, there was tRNAs mediating that again, suggesting you know very specific uh, evolutionary features. Uh, and then we also found places of rapid protein change, so basically you know where uh, some domains were very rapidly evolving. We found some cases of these compensatory frame shifts. Remember how we were talking before about this reading frame conservation test where you could basically go from one frame to another frame and back to the same frame. This, in fact, allows you to evolve new domains very, very rapidly while preserving the rest of the protein function. We found some examples where the stop codon was, in fact, lost in one species, and then there were uh, these expansions, and then, uh, you know, leading to new domains until then the next uh, stop codon. And then we also found this cool example of an in team. So, um, so that was basically all of these events were in very, yeah, sorry. What were proportion of inversions were flanked by tRNAs? I see, uh, I didn't, we didn't look at that in that direction. Basically, you know, will it always happen? Probably not, but yeah, we didn't look at that, yeah? 
Yeah, so basically, are you, are you talking about things that only uh, affect a subset of the population in a species, or are you talking about things that are short-lived in that species? Yeah, I mean, in a way, short-lived could be partly because it penetrates only a subset of the individuals in the species. Um, so basically, whether we could trace an event that happened and then was later reversed in short order would be the idea. So you have, you know, some kind of duplication event and then a loss that leaves behind some kind of evidence of a previous duplication. Is that the idea? Yeah. Um, yes, it's a, it's a good idea. You could look for that. We didn't look for that. And you know, you could basically argue for every kind of duplication event. Was it perhaps previously a longer duplication event? Is that the remnant? And to figure that out, you would need to look at, I guess, closer species or, you know, some kind of species that diverged in between the diversions of those guys to basically get at, you know, what was that intermediate state? Does that answer your question? Any other questions? Okay, so all of that was basically these rapid evolution events in species that were otherwise very, very closely related. They had, you know, almost the same gene content. But then one of the species that we studied was uh, more distantly related. And, um, you know, this was a comparison of these species that were about 20 million years uh, diverse from each other. But then there was one species that was uh, much more uh, diverse. And in fact, uh, part of the reason why we sequenced that species because uh, the sample that we had of another species within that group had in fact died and we wanted to sequence four species. So we went for that one even though it was a little further away and it turned out to be a very, very cool uh, story. Um, when we ran this algorithm for uh, the gene correspondence that basically gave a beautiful straight line for any pair of those species, what we found was this between uh, Baker's yeast and the species uh, called Cleobromasis walti. And this made no sense. Basically, uh, you know, there were just so many different off-diagonal elements. And um, what was really bizarre was that when you zoomed in to this uh, particular region, what you found was this picture. Do you notice anything funny about that picture? If I start tracing from the left to the right, all of the regions of these species, and I ask where do they match, here's a very compelling example where you basically see that they tend to match, yeah, multiple times. So, you know, this particular region matches Baker's yeast in both chromosomes seven and chromosome 10. And this was true for pretty much every region of the, of the genome that we looked. They were, you know, three genes here and five genes there. And they were, you know, maybe uh, 10 genes here and 10 genes there, five genes here, five genes there, 15 genes here, 15 genes there. That were all matching uh, in overlapping fashion. Uh, so that, uh, you know, was, quite, quite striking. And um, by zooming in and sort of tracing these regions, the hypothesis emerged that maybe this actually represented a duplication of not just one region, but maybe the entire genome. And if you look now within these regions as to what's happening to these genes, we found this very, very cool uh, pattern where about half the genes matched one chromosome, and the other half matched the other chromosome. This is very weird, right? There was only like two genes here that matched twice in both regions, but nearly every other gene matched exactly once. So what's going on here? What do you think happened? Yes, that would be one explanation where you basically have a series of translocation events where that region was broken up and rejoined but it would be very weird to break it up and rejoin it in a way that preserves the relative order of the half of the genes that are here, right? What else could have happened? 
you have a, one answer here. Weird homology recombination, that's a very good idea, where you basically had, you know, this region and that region somehow do, you know, some kind of weaving and then re-breaking, yeah? Good. Can you be a little more precise about that? Yeah. Yeah. Good, very good. So basically what you're suggesting is that maybe KOLT, maybe this region, it, it represents the ancestral state and then the ancestor of both species on this lineage maintained the original state. And on that lineage, um, you know, did its own evolutionary thing in the two copies separately. Anybody add more details? I'm missing some keywords here. Basically, your, your suggestion was in fact the opposite, that in fact that might be the ancestral state, and there was some kind of weird weaving of these to create that. Uh, even though this genome was sequenced first, your suggestions may be, hey, maybe that's the ancestral state, and there was some kind of weird alternative evolution. Any other comments? So the fact that these genes are there twice uh, was in fact a very good hint, but the strongest hint was the fact that all of the genes were in the right order and the right orientation. So then uh, the way to understand that is to um, reorder this region and basically put Chloromyces Walti in the middle. So basically all I did from here to there is just change the order of the chromosomes and now, can anybody tell me what happened? So you basically have this ancestral state. It was fully duplicated. And then how did we give rise to this and to that? Yes. Yeah, so then what, what, what happened? What would happen? Yeah, basically randomly get turned off or mutated in one of the chromosomes. Do you need evolutionary pressures to actually exclude these two copies? What you could have simply is neutral evolution. Basically, I need to carry out the function of this particular ancestral gene. This gene perfectly meets that function. So that other copy is free to be lost. I need to carry out this function. Well, this copy perfectly keeps that function. So that copy and then go off, accumulate mutations and get lost, okay? And then what you end up with is the presence of this gives freedom of that to be degraded and lost. There's no longer evolutionary pressure keeping it. So basically what you end up with is even though you had a complete presence of all of these um, genes in two copies in the ancestor of Saccharomyces cerevisiae, this basically was resolved by losing alternating genes. But notice that every single gene was in fact kept. So that means that I have kept all of the original functions. Moreover, some genes, this one and that one, were in fact kept in both copies. So that means that I'm now free to evolve a new function for one of the two copies, or perhaps both. I think this is kind of cool. Awesome. It was like 100% with me on sort of what's happened here. Awesome. So there's very few genes that remain in two copies, but it's the interleaving of these genes that basically tells us that, yes, there was complete duplication, and that's the only possible explanation. That's the sort of the most parsimonious explanation for maintaining the gene order. And you can see sort of this weaving here, and that was found for every single region of uh, so basically, every single chromosome of Chloromyces Walti maps to exactly two chromosomes of Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So there were no regions that mapped three times, and there was no region that was mapping one time over extended. 
It's a very good question. Um, the question is, if you put them in competitive environments, which one does better? If you go out in the fields of Tuscany and you uh, pick grapes and you sequence, what are you going to find? You're going to find Saccharomyces cerevisiae mostly. So this species is, you know, very, very abundant. And it is, you know, when you open your fridge and you make, you have, you know, baker's yeast, that's exactly that species. So the common yeast that we use for winemaking and beer and, you know, uh, bread and all of that um, is, in fact, descendant from whole genome duplication. So the idea is that perhaps that whole genome duplication event gave it the ability to evolve all these new functions based on these extra copies of genes that it had. And it has now become more evolutionary fit. The big question is, did it start out that way? And the answer is probably not. A, a species that has now duplicated and is starting to lose genes will have all kinds of problems in the short term because genes will be dysregulated because you'll have, you know, weird dosage events. You'll have to have mechanisms for regulating that and so on and so forth. The chances are it was initially very sick. And if you look at the timing of that event, the duplication event happened during the emergence of fruit bearing plants. So basically, you know, as you know, uh, plants evolved uh, many, many different stages from, you know, ferns ultimately to, you know, seeds and fruits and so on and so forth. So basically fruit bearing plants, they trick animals with all of the sugar that they put around their seed. They trick animals to just eat that fruit, give it all the sugar, and in return, the animal walks around, oops, and then spreads the seed. So that, you know, that's, that's why fruit bearing plants are so juicy because they trick animals into just eating them and, you know, moving them around. With all of these fruit bearing plants, there was this abundance of sugar in the environment. There was a, a very good time to be slightly sick at the time and then eventually take over as the dominant. Was another question? No regions, you mean? Or ah, that's a that's a great idea. So the question is, maybe if it wasn't a whole genome duplication, maybe if it was a series of tandem duplications of regions, we could find some ancestor that so, so some some current species whose ancestor had only some of the duplication event. The answer is no. You can actually trace the duplication events to a very very narrow time, and then there's just no species that has only some of it, but not all of it. Yeah. It's just different chromosomes. So basically, Saccharomyces cerevisiae chromosome 4 and chromosome 12, according to the color code. And you can see the genes that are in two copies are in black, and the genes in one copy are in gray. And you can see that almost every gene is exactly in one copy, except for a handful. Yeah? So it's hard to... Uh, no. Basically, if you look at this picture, the answer is obviously not. If you look at the whole genome, yes, there are some that are white. And the question is, you know, that don't match either of the two copies. And the question is, what happened? You know, is it possible that there's in fact a gene there, but we just haven't looked hard enough? And using that, yes, we were able to find additional genes. Um, sometimes there's a gene in the middle that doesn't quite match. And then again, using that, we can just say, oh, well, hey, that gene here seems to be matching that gene. And they're just very, very, you know, far from each other. This happened hundreds of millions of years ago. So, you know, you can actually recognize very distant homology. And of course, yes, in some cases, genes are actually lost. Yeah. yeah. Ah, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, not necessarily. Basically, um, you know, one reason why you would keep both copies might be redundancy. That, you know, if one breaks, you always have the other one around. But evolution doesn't quite work that way. Basically, you know, if one breaks, the other one will continue doing its function, it will be overexpressed and so, and so forth. There's a class of genes that were kept in two copies, and these are ribosomal protein genes. And that could be a question of abundance rather than redundancy. But you're right, redundancy could be another thing that basically if one particular individual doesn't have both functional copies, it can still make it 
without it, but evolutionarily, um, that individual will eventually go away. So basically in the short term, it can be helpful in the long term, you kind of need uh, both. And the reason is that after that duplication event, both species went on to have a bunch of rearrangements. In this particular case, if you see this very long symphony between chromosome uh, four here and chromosome four here, basically, you know, you see that, well, that's probably the ancestral gene order because these two agree. So the rearrangement probably happened here, 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 and there. And if you look at this long stretch here, that basically suggests that, yeah, maybe the arrangement happened here, here, and there. And then when you have a break, in all three of them, well, maybe, you know, that, uh, so, so anyway, you can, you can sort of figure out where are these older chromosomes, but the reason why they're in so many small pieces is because of rearrangements that happen after the whole drone duplication event, but because you have all these regions that are spanning these breakpoints, you can sort of argue that, well, we can tell a lot about that ancestral gene order, which was kept in one copy or the other. Here's one kind of cool example. If you look at this entire region, there's simply no duplicated genes. Every gene was kept in exactly one copy, except for a handful that you know, don't appear to be there at all. Uh, but, but still, you can tell that this region was fully duplicated, even though there's no duplicated genes left. And the other cool thing here is that the centromeres are in fact exactly in the, center, in the, in the same order. So basically, these centromeres are rather small, and what you can see here is that, in fact, there was exactly a one to two duplication of the centromere through leading to twice as many uh, chromosomes. In fact, that's true for every, uh, uh, every centromere. And that region example also shows you that sister regions can be recognized solely based on the gene order. We did not use the duplicated genes, we just used the interleaving genes. Yes? Yes, yes. So this, this figure is actually to scale. All the other figures are diagrammatic where I've actually stretched the genes out to be on top of each other. But uh, so the story of how this was discovered is kind of funny. I had basically promised uh, Bruce Biren and Eric Lander that I was working with in this paper at the time that um, when I saw that crazy scatter plot, I basically told them, I have no idea what's going on. Let's put this genome aside. Let's write that other paper. And I promise you, by the end of the year, I'll tell you what's going on. And it was like December 24 or something like that. I was like leaving the next day on the plane and I was in the lab working until like 11, 12 at night. And at 11.30 or so, I started doing this, you know, uh, stretching of the genome to sort of look at these duplicated regions. And that's where it hit me. I'm like, I'm looking at a whole genome duplication event. So I emailed them basically both saying, it's a whole genome duplication. And Bruce Beeren replied within minutes, basically saying, how big are these genomes? I was like, gosh. So I looked and Saccharomyces cerevisiae is 12 megabases of million nucleotides. Uh, Chromomyces walti is 10.5. It's not six, it's 10.5. So that basically says that, yes, indeed, there was this massive condensation and there was only like this, you know, 1.5, you know, 10% of the genome that was larger in, you know, the duplicated species. So even though you have two copies of every gene, you relatively have little additional DNA. So anyway, this is now uh, this duplicate mapping that fully tiles from Mrs. Cerevisiae, and you have 145 blocks covering 88% of the genome. So then, you know, figure one of the paper ended, being, ended up being this model, where you basically have that ancestral genome, the order is preserved here, and then basically the Saccharomyces lineage gives rise to two copies of every gene, differential loss, and then, you know, maintenance of only these genes. And it turns out that that figure made it into a textbook that one of my friends emailed me at some point, hey, hey here's a paper. And uh, there's a little uh, hidden message here, 313 happens to be my, my birthday. Um, and here's what's funny. All of you guys actually underwent 
two rounds of whole genome duplication. So about a year or two after this yeast duplication event was found, papers starting popping up everywhere, including a duplication of a vertebrate. So in the fish lineage, there were two rounds of whole genome, there was one round of whole genome duplication. And in fact, that wasn't the only one. Early in the vertebrate lineage, there appears to have been two rounds of whole genome duplication giving rise to all vertebrates. And some people postulate that maybe that's what led to this dramatic uh, expansion in body plan complexity in the vertebrate lineage compared to you know, uh, all of the previous lineages. And then these can be uh, traced uh, as you know, two separate events with some species showing only one of the two uh, rounds of whole genome duplication. So, um, you know, before this paper, Ken Wolf uh, had actually recognized that there were regions of the genome that had multiple duplicated genes and that these genes were in the same order and same orientation. So well before our paper in 1997, Ken Wolf had basically said, well, maybe there was a whole genome duplication that would explain this. But in fact, many others argued instead that there was, um, you know, only a series of segmental duplications, as you know, was suggested also in this class, uh, because this covered only a small fraction of the genome. So basically the picture that we saw uh, resolved that debate by basically saying that, um, you know, there was uh, truly a whole genome duplication. Yeah. Because you, you ended up losing entire genes by deletions. Exactly, a series of deletion events, yeah. Ah, that's a very good point. Well, yeast has two modes of life. It can live as, as haploid or as diploid. So it can reproduce asexually and it can reproduce sexually as well. Ah, well, you have all questions of incompatibility suddenly. Um, it's a fantastic question. We don't know. <laughs> All right, guys, we'll stop there. Thank you very much.